This is the ancient and medieval history uh, lecture for Thursday, September 2nd, 2021. Yesterday, these do have a notebook out, something to write on, something to write with, always, whenever I'm in front of the room. Uh, you will also need the package that I gave you the other day. We talked about the need to have a YouTube or a Google Classroom uh, presence. So accept my invitation. If for whatever reason you didn't get one, email me, and I will resend you the invitation. Uh, there you will find a number of things that you will need for the course on the stream page. Both documents, your maker questions, as well as videos of these lectures, like the one I'm recording right now. I then went into detail about chapter surveys. You're going to be doing chapter surveys throughout this year, and if you have me next year, once a week next year for the majority of the year. So you're going to have to get used to them. And at first, this is going to seem crazy bad because it'll take you five or six hours, maybe even more, to do a chapter survey because you're not used to it. You don't know what I expect, and you're going to... Uh, struggle to try to figure out how much are you supposed to put into those small little bits. You'll get there. It'll take time, but you'll figure it out. What I can tell you right now is that I do not read everything you write. I'm blind in my left eye, at least legally. I read fairly slowly. What I do is I randomly pick and choose a couple of sections to look at closely. And I judge your entire work based on those sections. I'm not going to tell you what those sections are. So if you do a half-hearted job that is lame, I will maybe notice it if I happen to read one of the sections that you do a half-hearted job with. Or, or maybe I won't. But... I have to do it this way because it's the only way I can read the volume of uh, material coming in. And you have to have that volume of material, not because it's busy work, but to give you different opportunities to learn. If you look on the syllabus, which I'm encouraging you to do since I'm sort of hinting, if you look on the syllabus, you will see that, uh, let's see, on Tuesday, September 7th, you're going to have short essays on terrorism. I'll be talking about that later in the week. The following Monday, September 13th, you're going to have a write-up on creation myths. I may or may not have you do a presentation. For Monday, the 20th of September, you have your first chapter survey. For Monday, the 27th of September, barely one week later, you have chapter survey two. Then you have case study stuff, which we'll talk about in a little while. I am here to train your long-term memory. Long-term memory is not what most teachers train. A math teacher, which is basically a form of language teacher, is going to work on the same thing that you're doing homework on and that you'll, being te you'll be tested on all in the same week, all at the same time. So will your Espagnol teacher, your Attenlay teacher, and your Francaise teacher. They will all work very intently item by item with you because they're training and loading your short-term memory, which hopefully will infiltrate your mid-term and long-term memory. But I'm a historian, a history teacher, and that means I have a different goal. So I ask you, and I will roll the dice on this, so think about the answer. What is history good for? What is history good for? Remembering that I don't know is not an answer, it is simply the beginning of an answer. What 
is history good for? And if you say nothing, you better be prepared to defend that, that the defamation. So, why don't you be number one? We'll go counterclockwise, and would you roll, please? Thank you. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sir. Uh, is good for uh, remembering like, mistakes of the past. Why would it be important to remember those mistakes of the past? So you don't make them again. Ah! Okay. Go on. Uh, and it's a society. If we learn from our mistakes. Okay. That is a good answer. It is a classic answer. It is the answer of the 20th century writer George Santayana, who said that those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. Note, it is not one of the quotes on my wall. At least I don't think it is because it's so commonly known. But there's truth in that, if we only learned. After we won World War I, we built down our army and navy to ridiculously low levels, so that when we had to fight the next war, World War II, our army had to train with broomsticks instead of rifles until they could be equipped with rifles, and trucks that had the word tank on them rather than tanks, because they didn't have enough tanks even to train with. Okay, after World War II, we have the largest Navy and Air Force on the planet. We have the second largest Army. What do we do? Oh, it's peacetime. We drop our military forces down to pre-war levels. Well, almost. And then the Korean War happened. And our army is caught napping, our navy and air force are uh, not ready. So we went in Korea, well, we have a tie in Korea. And then uh, there we, we don't completely build down our forces so that we actually have an army to fight with in Vietnam, but we put the wrong people in charge, so we lose there. It might occur to some, ah, after the Cold War, when the Soviets are defeated, when Russian communism is revealed to be a sham, a fraud, an evil form of government, even to their apologists here in the United States who love the Russians because they're the future. Uh, what do we do? We drop the size of our Navy, our Army, and our Air Force because it's peace! So that when we have to fight the war on terror, we have to rebuild. And if and when we have to fight the Red Chinese, the Chinese communists, which I hope we don't, but we might, ah, we're going to have to build our forces up again. Most of our aircraft were designed in the 1960s and built in the 1970s or 80s. The F-15 was designed around the year 1970. The F-16 around 1974. We have a handful of F-22s but they were designed in the early 90s. But we again, we have about 100 of them, which is nonsense. We need thousands and thousands of military aircraft if we're going to fight a war. The B-2 stealth bomber, best bomber in the world. We have about 100 of them. Actually, oh, God, no, we have less than 100. We have fewer than 100 of them. So the lessons of history are there to be seen if we would only look. But a lot of the time we don't. So we make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Because as smart as people are, they're not very wise. So, that's a classic answer. Does anyone wish to volunteer an answer as to what history is useful for? Oh, this is so sad. Because you're in here for all year, and you're going to be here next year, or in Mr. Burfine's room. Or, uh, and then you have Mr. Hall. Uh, and, and then you have uh, Mrs. Um, Mitchley. So you're going to be in classes that don't make much sense to you. What is history good for? I'm rolling again. And since you got the answer correct, would you hand this back to him, please? Would you please roll? And you are, uh, you are number one. We'll continue to go counterclockwise. What do you got? Five. Five. Okay, can you hand that forward again, please? Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. 
History is good for looking back maybe on important figures or important dates and making sure that oh that's kind of Take a breath, take a breath, no problem. It's horrible. He made us say history was useful when we know it's not. History is useful because we need to know what happens and certain patterns or certain reoccurring events so we can predict for the future so we can lose at least casualties as possible. Okay, yeah. That's related to what he said, but it's your own answer. Uh, basically, if we learn the patterns of how things work, we can take them into account when we do our planning. Okay. Those are both in the ballpark of what I'm looking for. Since few of you had these answers to hand, you may want to look carefully at the part of your notes that deal with item E, echo the uses of history. The first use is to teach wisdom from folly. Wisdom from folly, and that's, uh, that's in your note pack, which is the landscape formatted one on the first page. You'll see in your note pack uh, item E, the uses of history. And I added some things up here that you may want to add. Wisdom from folly. When the Greeks left the Trojan horse for Priam, king of Troy, and Priam, king of Troy, decides to bring this symbol of Greek defeat and Trojan victory into his city, they wheel it up to the gates, but it is too tall. It is too tall for the gates. So, they have a choice. They can leave it outside and have it be a big symbol by their gate, or they can take apart part of their defenses in order to bring the Pro Trojan horse in. Guess which one they chose? They actually disassembled part of their gate so that the top of the Trojan horse, of the, the horse the Greeks left for the Trojans, could be led into the city. And then, mm, as they were drunk, uh, it was revealed that Odysseus had filled the horse with uh, Greek warriors, who then opened the damaged gates and let the Greeks in, and everyone was slaughtered, and poor Cassandra was left to say, I told you so, I told you so, but nobody listened. And everyone said to Cassandra, what? We didn't hear you which is funny if you know anything about who Cassandra is. She was the woman cursed to speak the truth about the future, but part of the curse was that no one would listen to her. Throughout history, people do the darndest things. During the Black Death, a plague that we believe is spread by fleas on rats. The medieval Europeans decide that this is a curse from God, when they're not blaming the Jews for it, that this is a curse from God, and that they need to show their devotion by destroying the agents of Satan, the adversary. And who are the greatest agents of Satan in medieval villages? Evil witches. So, there is the greatest witch burning in European history, during the time of the Black Death. But it's not enough just to get the witches. Who works with the witches? What partner does Satan give to a witch to help her do her e-bill? Does anyone know, sir? A cat. Cats. Yep. Particularly black cats, but any old cat will do. Ah, Satan, we love you. That's what that's what cats that's what they thought cats were saying. So I really don't. So, <laughs> in addition to killing the witches, they killed all the cats they could at a time when they were being actually killed by fleas carried by rats. You can't make this up. It was the worst possible thing that they could have done. But they did it. Again and again throughout history, you will see absolute folly. Usually it happens when people are desperate or panicky. Not that we would ever do that, you who are wearing masks, even though your chance of getting the disease is so damn low, it's ridiculous. I'm much more likely to contract the disease, even though I've been vaccinated, than any of you. But we're wearing masks. Masks who have openings like this for a virus that's this small. 
They shut down the economy last year. We got people who want to shut down the economy this year. It's not like this is the first disease we ever had. A hundred years ago, we had the Spanish flu, which we could call the Spanish flu because there wasn't political correctness back then. Today, God forbid you're like me and you insist on using the Wuhan flu because that's where the disease comes from. And you get, oh, it's racist. No, it's where the disease comes from. That's what we call disease or we call diseases by their origin point. In any event, we didn't have all this a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu. We didn't have all this with Legionnaires disease or SARS. We didn't have this during World War II or World War I or the Cold War or any of that stuff. But suddenly, this, this, this disease requires us to completely abandon normalcy. Yeah, that's going to work out. Just like right after 9-11, which we'll be talking about, um, the country decides to give vast powers to the government to look at our mail, our email, our telephone conversations, and a number of other things in perpetuity. That's never going to come to bite us in the backside. No, no. When you are desperate, you don't necessarily make the wisest decisions. And one of the things that history shows us is example after example after example of people getting panicky and doing stupid things. That's one good thing about history. Another good thing, and it relates to this, wisdom from folly. There are lovely people in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, and maybe even here in this room, who aspire to be anti-fascists or anti-fa. They tend to, when they congregate, wear black hoodies and black masks and say, down with the police, up with anarchy. I, to them, am absolutely evil because I'm a conservative. Why are they angry? Why is BLM angry? Why are so many woke people angry? Because we're not perfect. Because we have not been perfect. By their lights, we are very imperfect people. By their lights, even though our country fights its bloodiest war to get rid of slavery, we are guilty of slavery, even though there isn't a person alive who was a slave in the United States or who owned a slave in the United States. Still, somehow, we are guilty of slavery. Nonsense. You're going to find in life that you are going to screw up mightily. And you're going to have your own sins to contend with. Don't take on the sins of others that are not yours to take on. None of you were slave owners. None of you were slaves. It's nonsense. And none of you have known what a genuinely racist society is. None of you. Do not act like you should be ashamed do not let anyone tell you that you're a bad person because of how you were born. That is kind of racist. And yet, that's the image that a lot of people are using. You know what defines us? Not slavery. The fact that we fought our bloodiest war to end it. A hundred years later, at the height of American power in the world, we ripped ourselves apart. My old neighborhood in the Bronx burned to the ground in race riots as we were getting rid of Jim Crow. What defines America is not a unique tendency to slavery because we're not unique. What defines America and Britain and other Western countries is that we are almost unique in the world in ending it, in getting rid of it. Is it wise? to damn people for not being perfect, which is what Antifa does. Is it right to damn people because of a history that by modern standards is bad, but by the standards of the day was normal? Is it right to assign collective guilt? I don't think so. I don't think it's a reasonable standard to say that we need to be perfect. I've never met a perfect person. I have nothing in common with them. You've never met a perfect person either, unless you are remarkably well-traveled. I don't believe perfection is possible for us. I don't think it's even desirable. Would you want to live in a perfect society? A crystalline reality where you're like a drone in a hive, aspiring to live up to somebody else's idea of utopia? 
We are what we are. The most reform-minded, progressive society in the history of humankind. And yet, there are people willing to burn down courthouses and assault everyone who gets in their way because we aren't perfect. And because people in 1860 didn't live by the standards of people in 2021. Is that wise? Is that reasonable? Is that fair? I know what I think. You develop your own opinion. I don't care if it disagrees with mine. But please, as you develop your opinion, I think you owe it to yourself to consider the history of people. Because the history of people will tell you what is reasonable and not reasonable to expect. A thousand years from now, assuming we continue to progress, people may look at us as absolute savages. We walk around without covering our skin. I mean, we have clothing, but we don't have the layer of force field that they walk around with, so we smell one another. We smell the nature. We smell all that dirt out in the wilderness. We smell the ocean, which is the world's sewer, which is, by the way, don't ever think of the ocean that way. It's a horrible way to think of the ocean. The ocean is grand, glorious, wonderful. No, no, it's so much more. Um, th they would look at us as nasty because we make distinctions between human beings and animals. I'm not even talking eating meat. I'm talking viewing a dog as a lovely creature in some ways more noble than we are, but not really self-aware, not really possessing human rights because they're not human. A thousand years ago, they may look at us and say, oh, you're a species as human rights, eh, bad. And they'll try to make your descendants feel guilty about it because you had human rights. What about the animal? What about the plants? Don't you know that grass feels pain? Think about how horrible mowing your lawn is since grass feels pain. I actually enjoy it more. But... <laughs> In any of you. <laughs> History is good for wisdom for folly. The other thing is your cultural identity. And I talked about this the other day. There's a reason why we speak English. There's a reason why girls tend to wear skirts and men tend to wear trousers. There's a reason why girls tend to have longer hair and men tend to have shorter hair. There are, I say tend to, there are always exceptions. Uh, there are reasons why we think freedom is good and slavery is bad. There are people who think the other. There are reasons why we don't think that people from the same family should sleep together. There are reasons why we don't think that people should eat human flesh or sacrifice children on a fire altar or cut the living hearts out of sacrifice victims to, to appease evil, you know, uh, hungry gods. There are reasons for all of the things that exist around us. History is the source of where you'll uh, discover why, why, why the world is as this. Is the world perfect? No. Can you try to make it better? Hell yeah. But if you start from a utopian standpoint, where you imagine perfection and then blame us for not being what you imagine to be perfect, there's a brittleness to that. There's a spoiled bratness to that. Look at history, see where we've come from, see where we can go. Anyway. All of this is useless if you don't remember it. 20 years from now, you're going to be making a decision that's going to affect your life and the lives of people who trust you and who love you. If you don't remember history, you won't be able to take advantage of the successes and failures of people who were in a situation a lot like yours. If you remember it, even if you don't remember me, even if you don't remember where you learned it, if you remember the stories, something of the stories, you might make a wiser choice because you will have seen somebody make a choice like this and it turns out good. Somebody makes a choice like this and it turns out bad. Somebody makes a mid-level choice and it turns out okay with some bad elements. So my goal is to teach your long-term memory. And my understanding of psychology is that imagine that your brain is sort of a damp wall. Remember, bring something warm. Um, if you want to go get a jacket, sign up for pants and come back. What? I didn't bring today. Oh, sorry. Um, imagine that your memory is like a cement wall, and that knowledge is bits of wet clay that you're going to hurl at it. <laughs> now, sometimes the clay bounces off and falls, not gonna, you're not going to remember it. 
sometimes it sticks and then slides down and it's gone. And sometimes it sticks and it stays. My goal is to have as much of the mud that I throw at your brain stick. You try explaining that to people at home, they won't understand. <laughs> He's throwing mud at brain. <laughs> He's getting all sticky. He's creepy. <laughs> so, here's a bit of knowledge. You read about it in your book. Then you write about it in your homework. So, and as you're reading about it, that's one way of learning, and you have to then interpret it and write about it, that's a second way of learning. But I always have you do your homework weeks or even a month or more in advance of when we cover it in class. So then other things happen. And then we come back to it. I lecture about that bit of knowledge. <laughs> and then I quiz you on it. Yeah, mix it up a little bit. Then you will learn that any time you make a wrong answer in, on a quiz or a test, except for the silly test and the final exam, all other tests, you can rewrite wrong answers for half credit. So if the question was, blank attack Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and you put the uh, Lithuanians, that's wrong. So on a separate sheet of paper, uh, you would write the uh, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And along with all the other corrected answers from your wrong answers, you staple it to the front of your test, turn it back in, and if you earned a 40, you get a 70. If you earned an 80, you get a 90 if you correct all your tests. So you can improve your quiz and exam grades just by doing a little hard work. That's another chance to learn. Then we've got the unit exam, which you study for, which you take, which you rewrite wrong answers for. Then there's the final exam for the semester in January or in June. I don't know how many bits of mud I've winged at your mind, but... It's a lot of them. That is, say, 10, 11, 12, however many it is, times that your mind has a chance to hold on to that knowledge. And it's long-term memory, because it's done over a long period of time. So that's why the homework is given the way it is. Any questions on that? OK. Now, we are opening up behind the syllabus Okay, I know I hit this yesterday, but I'm going to hit it again just because my class has a warning label, and the warning label, oh, I could read it to you, but you're smart people, so I'm going to summarize it. We are going to talk about things in here that people thought worth fighting for or against. We're going to talk about things in here that some people consider obscene, and some people consider uh, evil, and some people consider taboo. We're going to talk about things that people in the past thought was worth living for, dying for, and even killing for. Because that's what history is made of. History is still going on right now, obviously. And look at all the things people are willing to bludgeon each other or stab each other or shoot each other over in our world today. There's plenty. So we're going to study them. We're going to talk about them. This probably will upset you. Perhaps you have a religious scruple about something. And your religious beliefs are extremely strong, and that's a wonderful thing. I have very strong religious beliefs as well. But what we're talking about is not in keeping with maybe even opposite of what you believe. Well, express your point of view. But understand, I am not going to alter what I teach to suit the personal or familial religious preferences of every single one of my students. I can't do that. What I'm going to teach is a traditional mainline approach to teaching the history of Western civilization. And we're going to talk about things openly. So if you want to play devil's advocate, play devil's advocate. It will disturb you. If you're doing it right, it will upset you. That's good. That shows you're doing it right and taking it seriously. So please don't expect that I'm going to be walking on eggshells trying not to offend you. Quite the opposite. And it's not that I'm trying to get in your face just to disturb you and see you go, Ugh! I'm not. That's, that isn't the point. 
The point is this. History is not dry. History is not just a bunch of facts. History is not memorizing names and names and dates. History is the real story of flesh and blood, blood people like you and me facing the crises of their moment in time and space. Deciding what they're willing to risk their lives for. What they're willing to dedicate their lives to. And what they're willing to defend with violence if somebody tries to stop them. That's what history is about. It's passion. It's not merely intellectual. And... I've had people who are top students who really had a problem with my approach because they viewed history as just another subject that you study in school. No. I'm not a psychologist. I don't understand beyond a certain point the theory of the mind, nor do I agree with a lot of what they say. I'm not a philosopher. I understand a little, not much. I'm not here to imagine what people might be at some point. I'm a historian. I study what people do what they really do. You know, you can think about what is a city, and you can imagine all these utopian ideas of what a city could be. I lived in one. I lived in the greatest city in the United States, New York City, and I can tell you, it's a place with wonders and horrors. It's a place where you can go to some of the best museums on earth and get robbed casually on the street by armed people, and that's normal. It's normal. Cities are everything in between. You can buy anything in New York City, whether it's legal, illegal, moral, immoral. If you've got the money, you can make it happen. Jeffrey Epstein and his pederasty for the rich and famous didn't happen out of nowhere. The rich and famous paid him lots of money to have sex with children. Awful. The reality of what people are and what people do is what I'm covering, not the theory. And in reality, we are both angels and demons in human flesh. We have in each of us the capacity to be saints or to be monsters. All of us do. That's the complexity of human nature. And the way it plays out when people are desperate, when people are calm, when people are weak, when people are strong, is what the story of history is all about. The story of history is also about people who are powerful saying, you can't fight City Hall. You're powerless. You're a plebe. You're a peasant. You're a peon. You're, you're scum. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think because you're not from the right family or you're not from the right background or you don't have the right degree after your name. You are unimportant except as laborers and as people who obey our laws. That's a lie. But it's a lie that tyrants tell. And since tyrants control the men with the guns, they often get their way until or unless people try to stop them with violence. If I were to ask you what the opposite of war is, what would be the obvious answer? As a class, please say it in three seconds. What is the opposite of war? Three, two, one. Peace. Yeah. Not really. The opposite of war is often surrender. You are faced with a threat. This is something that the Peace Party rarely, under, rarely expresses. Wars don't happen because people hunger for adventure. Not usually. Wars happen because people are threatened by aggression. Like a bully in the schoolyard who wants your lunch, lunch money. And who will humiliate you and pound you until they get it. Or if they don't want your lunch money, they just want your dignity. So you're faced with an aggressor. You can fight them, or you can surrender to them. There is no peace. Peace is like a cat leash. You know what a cat leash is? You dangle a string in front of the cat. If the cat bites onto the string and follows it around, it's a leash. When the cat gets bored, it'll let go of the string. It doesn't work anymore. Why? Because the cat's no longer interested. It takes two to have peace, not one. Your mom, God bless her, was wrong when she said, it takes two to fight. No, it just takes one to fight. Somebody willing and eager to use violence to get what they want. You have then a choice. You can fight them, or you can flee from them or give them what they want. That's not peace. That's surrender. So when you are faced personally, when we are faced as a nation, when humanity is faced as a species with an existential threat that could take our lives, our freedom, what do we do? 
Do we fight? Do we flee? Do we surrender? What do we do? Those types of questions are all played out in history. So we're going to explore that. I'm going to tell you my opinions because they're just opinions. You tell me your opinions and we will discuss them. I expect that you'll disagree with me, many of you. Fine, good, that's as it should be. I'm not here to make you conservative. I'm not here to make you think like me. That's weird and creepy. I am here to make you think. And God willing, I'll do that. What you say in here is your choice. I am not a politically correct guy. I won't use politically correct terms. You use whatever terms you want. If you want to be the most wokest, politically correct, social justice warrior in the world, be my guest. Do so. It'll make the conversation more interesting. But we will do it with a mutual respect. And we will do it because discussing ideas is better than accepting them without question. Hmm? Any questions on the warning label? Below the warning label, you see the signature sheet, and again, your printed name, your signature, your date, your parent or guardian signature, their date, uh, and their initials on my movie policy, which is yes to battlefield violence, yes to selfie language, no to strong sex. Any questions on that? If you haven't yet done so, get it signed, tear it off, turn it into the period, one shelf before 3 p.m. this coming Tuesday. That's the due date. If you turn in anything late, you lose 30 points off the top, period. Anything. Even a moment late, beyond that 3 p.m. deadline on the day it's due, you lose 30 points. You can do a perfect job, should get an A-plus, 100%, and at best you'll get a 70. Please get your work in on time. Next page. Uh, you know what grades are. A's are good. F's are bad. Try to get A's, not F's. Uh, this, by the way, is a class... That's hard to get A's in, but it's not hard to pass. If you do your work, if you try your best, whether or not you're a gifted student doesn't matter. Hard work will earn success in this room. However, earning an A across the board, that's difficult because A's are exceptional. If you do everything I'm asking you to do, you'll get a B or a C. If you do everything I'm asking above and beyond, then you'll get an A. So you should expect to get somewhere in the high 70s to low 90s if you're doing everything I'm asking without doing anything above and beyond. If you do something above and beyond, then you are in the A. And I'll make that clear as time goes on. You'll know exactly what I mean, so don't worry about it. Uh, let's see. 30% of the course is exams and major projects. You'll know about those in advance. 30% of the course is quizzes and minor projects. I give quizzes whenever I want. I don't warn you. I don't tell you. You'll see a pattern for some quizzes, but some quizzes will come out of nowhere because quizzes are a snapshot of what you happen to know at a given moment. Uh, classwork and homework is 30% of the grade. I give 10% attitude, participation, and preparedness. If you show up every day, do what I ask you to do, unless you think it's immoral, uh, argue then that it's immoral in a good and uh, strong and decent and respectful manner. If you do good studenty stuff, you get that for 10% of your grade. If you participate, raising hand, offering ideas, you're going to get a better. Uh, you're going to you're going to you're going to keep that A plus. If you just sort of sit here and are passive, you'll at least get a B. If you show up and have a bad day, true story. About 15 years ago, my wife and I were living in a red cottage in the Maine woods, and we had some cats. And I had a friend in upstate New York, 500 miles away, whose family was in crisis. I had some time. They were like, they are like family to us. So I was going to leave, and I left early that morning. But her car was the better running car at that point. So I took her car and she was going to take my car to work. But that morning we had scheduled flea dip. The cats were going to be taken in for a flea dip. And this was to a place we had never been. It was recommended to us. So Tina, my wife, had to um, wrangle the cats into the kitty carriers. 
ah! She finally got them in, drink, and they're locked. And then she put them in the car, and because we were in the main woods, it was 50 minutes to the kitty carrier place on her way to work. And all the way, the cats are like a TIE fighter, frothing at the mouth, liquid coming out of literally every orifice on their bodies. They hate the cats we had at that time, traveling in the car, and they hate the idea of going to the vet, and they knew that they were going to do something like that. So she finally arrives. She loves the cats, and she's very motherly towards them, so she's emotionally exhausted by like 7.30 a.m. when she arrives, and she opens the door, and the stench hits there. This is a filthy place. This is not a place where we would send our worst enemies' pets to be cared for. So she makes an executive decision, turns around, heads home. Ah! 45 minutes, all the way home. Gets the cats out of the carrier. Ba-doom, 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 we hate you, mom cat. And they go off to, to be angry. She calls work, says she's going to be late. Drives 50 minutes from our home into Portland, Maine. Parks the car in the lot across the street from her office. She worked in insurance at that time. Crosses the street, goes upstairs, sits in her queue with the looks at, sees the car, and gets to work. Okay. Sometimes it's nice just to be back at work with all the melodrama that goes on. I wasn't there to help her with any of this because I was driving to New York. 45 minutes later, she looks up and there's an empty spot where the car should be. She doesn't remember what happens next. The next thing she remembers, she is standing in the center of the cubicle farm in the office, eyeball to eyeball with her office manager, going, I can't believe you towed my bleeping car! And she didn't say bleeping. She had lost it. And this little never should be guy, oh, we'll find it, we'll find it, don't worry, we'll get your car back. You didn't have the parking sticker on it because it wasn't your car because it was your husband's. Ah! Well, she finally calms down. Now, You do that to most bosses, and you're fired for good reason. But she was one of their best workers. She had never done anything like this before. She just snapped. It happens, okay? It'll happen to all of you if it hasn't happened already. You're just going to reach your limit, and you'll lose it. If you have a bad day in here, and suddenly bad things happen within reason, Get up and leave. Go to the office before it becomes a crisis, and we'll deal with it afterwards. If you have to on the way out, if it's messy, if there's a bad behavior or whatever, we'll deal with it. If it's not part of a pattern, if it's just something that happened because you had a terrible day, everyone has terrible days. It's not a problem. We'll, del- we'll work it out. There may be things that need to be done, but we'll work it out. It's not a problem. The only problem is if those sorts of things happen as a pattern. That I won't put up with because a pattern isn't a bad day. A pattern is a choice not to give a damn. So please behave well. And uh, if you have a bad day, we'll deal with it. It's not a big deal. Everyone has that. But don't make a pattern. Don't make a habit of it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now we're on side two. Oh, we've been on side two. Uh, so, daily expectations, you know what that is. Next page. Absences and expectations. If you're not here, you still are expected to perform when you return. This is a little different than the school handbook policy. Let's say you've been out for a week because you've been sick. And you come back and I'm giving a quiz. I expect you to take the quiz. But I was at, I expect you to take the quiz. But I couldn't, I expect you to take the quiz. And one of the reasons I expect you to take the quiz is because you can watch these videos at home before you come back. Now, if there's a, some special thing going on, let me know or have your family net let me know and I'll be reasonable. But in general terms, when you come back, you're expected to just jump into whatever we're doing, even if it's a quiz or a test. If there's something weird or unusual, come let me know. We've already talked about, I don't know, it's not an answer, it's the beginning to one. You are expected to have paper in front of you whenever I'm talking. Uh, Your note pack should also be out. What you write is your own business. As long as it's not giant obscene limericks or, or pictures or anything like that, as long as it's not a distraction, I don't care what you write. Some teachers check your notes, I don't. 
but you will have something to write on and write with. Extensions are rarely given because I give you your assignments months in advance. If something happens and I give you an extension beforehand, I will write you a note. You will then staple that to your work, which will come in late. When I see my own note, I'll remember, ah, you have an extension, and I won't mark you off for lateness. Um, get those in advance. Late work policy, minus 30 off the top for anything late. Work not turned in is a zero until it's turned in. When I do the grades, if your work hasn't come in yet, it's a zero. But I didn't turn it in. It should be a null. No, it's a zero until it turns in. And zeros are the vampires of the grading world. A zero can suck the quality out of your GPA like nothing else. So try not to have too many of them. Uh, answering all test questions. I'm telling you, adults need to guess their way through or bluff their way through all sorts of situations. So if on one of my tests you don't know the answer, take your guess. Take your best guess. BS me. Who knows? You might be right. You at least have a shot of getting it right random. Take that shot. If you leave it blank, it's a cop-out, and it's also a guaranteed wrong answer. Take a guess. you got nothing to lose. If it's wrong, you do a rewrite. Not a big deal. But take your best shot. Also, I've learned over the years that your initial impulse is probably the right one. If you second-guess yourself on tests, you often guess your second-guess yourself out of a right answer into a wrong answer. Because your intuition often remembers what your conscious mind doesn't. Any questions, comments, or thoughts so far? I know, again, we're doing rules, but we're trying to get ahead of the game so that the rest of the time we can talk history. Okay. Um, improving exam and quiz grades. I've explained that. Rewrite wrong answers for half credit, staple it to the front, and, and these have to be in complete sentences. In com you write longhand a complete sentence. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941. And that is how you earn it. That's how I justify it, because you have to rewrite it as a complete statement. So don't just give me A, C, whatever. If you're doing a map item, and you say, like, where is France? France is north mm, east of Spain, uh, of Spain. Or France is northwest of Italy. Or France is south of England. Uh, France is uh, west of Germany. You have a relative location. Any questions on that? I see none. Uh, plagiarism. Christ on a stick. Write your own words. Do not copy-paste. I have almost everything that you have to turn in for me handwritten. Why? Because I hate the world of copy-paste. And it's so seductive. It's so tempting. Always write things in your own words. Now, I'm going to let you work together. If you want to have study groups where you divide up the work, be my guest. But when it comes to writing, any writing, short essay, long essay, anything like that. Use your own words. Do not copy someone else's words unless you are quoting them. And quotes should be a fairly rare and occasional thing. Because in writing something in your own words, I know you understand it. That's the point of history. Knowing that you understand it, I can say, yep, yeah, they deserve an A or a B. Please. Write things in your own words. If you copy someone else's words, I don't have to prove it in the court of law, nor do I have to prove who's giving whose answers. You both will suffer penalties. Do not plagiarize. Do not steal someone else's words and make them and claim them as your own. There's no need to do that here. Just write it yourself. If you both come up with an answer about, I don't know, the story of William Tell, Taking an apple, putting it on his son's head, and shooting it with a crossbow to demonstrate something. His courage, his son's courage, Swiss independence, whatever. Um, we can tell that story, each of us, in a slightly different way. That's all I'm asking. Use your own words. Speak in your own voice. And by the way, I can tell the difference between a high school freshman or sophomore's voice and an encyclopedia's voice. The, the difference is obvious. So just please, have integrity. Personal electronic devices. Once that uh, pocket thing arrives, you're going to be putting all your smartphones and your smartwatches into pouches that I'm going to hang somewhere where I feel like. And you'll drop them off at the beginning of the class. You'll pick them up at the end of the class. You are never allowed to have them in here unless I have approved them specifically for you that day. 
Also, I have seen too many teachers captured on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. If you record me without my permission, and you will never have my permission unless I give it to you in writing, I will sue you or your family. Defamation of character. You do not have the right to record me or this class. I am doing the recording. If anyone wants to see the record, I'm making a record for people to see. But you are not supposed to have your devices, first off, and second of all, you do not have the right to record me against my will. And I don't want to be recorded by you. I, I have a big enough presence on, on YouTube and on the Internet. That's fine. I don't need more. Now, if there's a special reason, come talk to me about it. We can work it out. That's fine. But just as a matter of relational relationship, that's a betrayal of trust. Uh, I guess we have gotten to item number 17, and I will leave it there. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? My goal is to be through all of this class policy stuff before Friday. We're done and into the history. Yeah. So for the short and long essays, are yes. we we're writing an actual essay for that, or is it just coming up with a thesis? You're coming up with a thesis. You're filling out my form. Yes. Yeah. That's the essay. Got it. I know that you could all take that and build an essay out of it. I don't want that. That's an extra layer of fancy schmancy I don't need. What I want is to have you demonstrate that you can take answer a question with historical evidence, with a clear rationale where you argue a thesis. You have to argue a thesis. We'll talk more about that. And where you can talk about why it matters. That's all I want. I don't need some typed up, double spaced, whatever format is the format of the day. I don't need that. I don't want it. You don't have to do it. Okay? Just ask for a simple yes or no. I know. But I go off. Have a good day, folks. And thank you for your attention. No, you just do that. That's a lot of jazz. I can write it.